CR101radio.com, podcasts, and more. Welcome back to another episode of Preschool Pioneers. I am your host, Jeremy Walker. You can follow us on our parent network, CR101 Radio, on social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Gab, and YouTube. And you can subscribe to this podcast on your preferred platform so you never miss an episode. Visit CR101radio.com for these links. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is Preschool Pioneers, and I'm happy to have you back again with us today. This episode of Preschool Pioneers is entitled, In is for Nationalism, the importance of having and promoting respect and support for one's nation, and what parents and teachers can do to promote this. Well, welcome back, everybody. I want to go ahead and jump into this episode entitled In is for Nationalism. And I want to start with some basic commentary. And then I want to go into what can help us benefit our children, ourselves as parents, and also as Christian teachers as well. So I want to ask the question to start off with when we always are talking about this as Christian parents and teachers, and that's what Preschool Pioneers is all about. What is it that we want for our children? Our children personally might be your sons and daughters, or they might be your sons and daughters by faith, because you are the teacher, and you are teaching children, and you become part of their family. I know lots of people don't think of it in that manner. They just think of it as some kind of a separated concept, where you have the home and the school, and the grocery store. But whenever a teacher gets the opportunity to take on a student, they are getting a chance to mold the future. That's right. They're getting a chance to mold the future. I wish more people would grasp that simple concept. Parents in particular don't get it. Right now we are infested with parents who are obsessed with themselves. They're egocentric entirely. Everything is me, me, me. Even when you talk to people and listen to their advice, it's all about the parent experience of being a parent. It's never about the child. It's never about the parental responsibilities. It's not about the end product that you are going to eventually turn out which is the adult that your child is now going to become. There are some people that do get this, but it's very rarely the parent, and it's very rarely the teachers that are Christian. It, if you are on the other side of things, if you are a non-Christian teacher, a non-Christian politician, they get this point very much. Now, they want parents to be ignorant because they don't want the family to be a government that is in competition with themselves. That's right, because the family is and has its own government, just like civil government has its own government with people in charge, and so does the family. But if you are a maniacal, crazed civil government and you don't want competition, then you want very weak families. You want very weak parents. You want people thinking about the next TikTok challenge, not about their family or familial responsibilities as a husband, as a wife, a father, or a mother. You do not want that. And so you will not teach it. You will take every opportunity you can to destroy the family. You'll take every opportunity to drive a wedge between the parent and the child. You will tell the parent they are there for nothing more than a physical support. That's it. Room and board and feed. You're not there to educate. You're not there to teach. 
You're not there to discipline. You're not there to guide. Give them food. Give them water. Give them a place to live. And then give them to us for everything else. That is what currently in the United States of America, our government school's current position is. And because of that, there is a large group of people that have flocked to the government schools where the vast majority of children attend. And these are the ones with the rainbow flags. And that rainbow flag means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's why it is such a large spectrum. It's not just about people that are homosexuals or lesbians, as an example. This is a very, very large banner, a very, very big overarching, encompassed group of peoples. If you're going to really put your finger on what that rainbow flag, and it's not even rainbow anymore, it continues to change and grow in colors and length and complexity. Why? They continue to bring in more and more people, not just people who have sexual perversions of the, as their preference, but also people who have crazed ideas about how to run governments socialism, communism, and all the other stuff that might be in the middle. It's a very large spectrum. Because of that, if you want to understand why it's everywhere, why is it that governments, why is it that corporations and businesses, it's June, why is it everybody is having to show their support by putting and changing their logos and this and that for this concept? It's because it's not for one thing. It doesn't have one meaning. It is one overarching meaning. That overarching meaning is humanism. That's right. If you're going to put a word on it, it is humanism. And that's what it means. Anti-Christian. Simple as that. They are flying the flag that is at war with God and war with Christianity, and which means all of God's people. That is the war we are facing. Now, the concept that we're talking about is nationalism, and nationalism has been getting a bad rap, and it does have a bad connotation, but it also has a very good connotation. If we were going to start and say, well, what is nationalism? I want to give some brief definitions here and kind of go from there and discussing how we as parents or teachers, how can we apply this to our classrooms, our students, our children? And what is it? Is it a bad thing to have national pride? Are there any dangers that are there? Well, let's jump into it. Some brief definitions for nationalism are among those like this. Nationalism is an ideology expressed by people who fervently believe that their nation is superior to all others. These feelings of superiority are often based on shared ethnicity, language, religion, culture, or social values. Nationalism holds that each nation should govern itself, free from outside interference or self-determination, that a nation is a natural and ideal basis for a polity, and that the nation is the only rightful source of political power. Nationalism seeks to promote itself and protect itself from outside influences and controls. So right now, if you were going to put your finger on it, if I was going to do that now, why is it that people like Donald Trump is called a nationalist? And when he says, make America great again, it used to be the original slogan that he had, why was this such a horrible thing? Well, because there is a large group of people that want a one world government. It's not enough to have lots of small governments where humanism is in full control over America and Canada and Mexico and Russia. You get the idea. They want it to where there's a one world government where everyone listens to a Sado king or cabal or government, however you want to call it, the United Nations board, whatever classification you want to put on it. But they want a centralization of power where man governs all, and he also determines all. The predestination of man, where mankind controls its own future and direction. 
At least that's always been from Genesis 3.5, the tempter's original plan for mankind. You will be as gods knowing and or determining good and evil for yourselves. But now we're going to do it on a large spectrum. So then the question has to be asked, why would people be at war with humanism just in smaller groups, all split up? Why would this be a problem? Because after all, it's still humanism, right? Just all over in different little spheres, but it's still the same thing, just different flavors. Well, I'll give you a really good idea of that. And for our, our children, our students, they need to know what God has done in history and how man has been trying to reverse everything. He's at war with God on every level. So this subject of nationalism, they're at war with this subject because of the concept of the Tower of Babel. There used to be a one world government at Babel. They called it the Tower of Babel, where there was all man speaking one language under one government, and there was no restraint on his evil, every thought, his every intention. God, in his determination, decided to help man and to separate, segregate men. And primarily, that was based on language. Now, I know a lot of people think that the biggest separation has to do with your ethnicity, your skin color, but that is not it. It is your language that primarily separates mankind, and God did that on purpose. Now, that was God's judgment to separate man. He wants man separated. So what does man want? Humanism then says, we don't want to be separate. We want to be unified. We want us all to be working together against God. We don't want lots of little sects out there. You are going to fight God in your way, and you're going to fight God in your way as humanism. No, no, no. When you come together, pool our resources, pool our power, and we need to take God on unified front, man versus God and God's people. That's their desire, and that's why nationalism is now a dirty word. Because when I was growing up, early 80s, early 90s, American patriotism was an all-time high. Everybody wanted to be an American. At least if you were an American, you loved being American. And it was a wonderful thing. What are they trying to do now, the globalist ideas and people? They are trying now to make that a dirty word. To make it to be an American is to be disgusting, to be dirty, something to be ashamed of. America is the greatest nation on planet Earth and has been for a very long time. Now, it's gotten a lot more dirty over the last 25 to 30 years, but it's still at its core a Christian nation. Why do you think they're having to pour people on in? bringing in people to invade America illegally so that they can try to change America. Because they're not changing the Americans. That's right. They're not changing the Americans. They're bringing in foreigners. This is not even immigration. This is an invasion. There's a giant difference. And there used to be a thing called treason. And it needs to come back and become a popular word that we utilize. But... To be a nationalist, to put your nation first, to put America first, is a dirty word for them. They don't want the idea of nations governing separately, even if it is under humanism. They want a one world government under man, all at war with God. Now that right there is the root. But as Christians, we should promote a wonderful love of your country, where you're from. There's nothing wrong with that, the culture that you come from. Now, you can do a couple things. You can support and love the language that you're born into. You can support the culture that you're born into, like if how you dress, if it's Southern culture, if it's Russian culture, Chinese culture, maybe it's Mexican culture, the dress, the, the music, the different things like that. Our differences in culture are wonderful. Those things are all very good. The people there can be proud to be Mexicans and proud to be Russians and proud to be whatever that you are. 
You should be proud to be those things and be happy. But is that the primary thing? See, we're parents. We're Christian teachers. And the main goal we should be getting our children proud of is not our family name. Like you're not proud to be a McCoy or whatever it might be, but you should be proud to be that because that's who the family God gave you. And he puts you in that nation, so you should be proud to be like an American. But that's not where your identity comes from. We are promoting the family of God. And God says, if you are primarily a McCoy, whatever you are, if your primary is that I'm a, a, a Hispanic, I am a black, I'm an Asian, if that's your primary affiliation, you have a problem. If your primary affiliation is your blood, who your mama is, who your daddy is, your nation, if those are your primary affiliations, then you have a major problem because you've only risen to the level of a good humanist. That's it. Remember what we talked about, humanism as a whole versus humanism in division. It's still all humanist. It's still all evil. So we are supposed to promote a sense of heritage, a sense of pride in who we are, and thankfulness to our parents, right? Thankfulness to our parents, thankfulness to our history, thankfulness to our nation. However, our primary goal is to not create good sons and daughters who are loyal to mommy and daddy and their family name, their family heritage, the crest. That's not the goal. The goal is not to promote that you are an American, America first, and you get an American flag tattooed on your chest, Donald Trump on your back. That is not enough. As Christians, that's not remotely enough, and we should not be promoting that as our ultimate identity. Our ultimate identity is with Christ, with God, being the saints of God. That has to be as Christian parents and as Christian teachers, our primary thrust. All these other things are good and, and, and dandy, but the primary thrust, thrust is, are you a Christian and obedient to God or not? That's it. That's what it comes down to. Because you cannot be loyal to your country and laws that might be in opposition to God and his laws. You cannot put your Authority first being your nation and its leaders. It must be God, which means that your nation and its leaders are limited and obligated to obey God. And you will obey that government, even if it doesn't consider itself under God, because we know that those powers are ordained of God. And the Christians in the first century could be underneath Caesar without combating Caesar, they're not picking up their weapons to try to overthrow Caesar. Caesar was not in power because he took it or seized it. Power does not come out of the barrel of a gun. Power comes from God. Power is given by ordination of God. Authority is granted by God. No government on the planet exists all by itself in a vacuum. And the sad part is, is that many people understand the concept of power and they do see the power of nations and men and even people like the UN and these worldwide cabals trying to control everything. And they look to the future with fear, with trepidation. And our children are growing up. And I remember a long time ago, there was a movie and a man said it would be a cruel thing to bring a child into this world with all the problems that it has. As if the world is just out of control and we're just going to saddle our children with all these problems and it's just doom and gloom all the time. These national cabals are out of control and nobody has them in check. Well, as Christian parents and teachers, I want to share with you our perspective and what we should be giving to our children about this concept and where our fidelity should be, where our confidence in the future should be. From Proverbs chapter 21, this comes from verse 30, quote, and this is from the Berkeley version of the Bible, not King James, but the Berkeley version, but they're all very similar. Quote, 
There is no wisdom. There is no understanding. There is no counsel against the Lord. Unquote. That is what we should be sharing with our children, with our students. Man is so willing to acknowledge the powers of evil, to see that they do hold real power. There is no debate about it. Satan has real power. He gives power to evil men for evil purposes. But then that's all men can see. They do not understand the powers of God. And all these evils, though truly evil, are still completely under control and following the plan of God and his predestinating direction. See, verse 31, also of Proverbs 21, says this, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. We do not have to be pessimistic about our futures. We don't have to be pessimistic about if evil men are running amok and if they're going to be able to overthrow God and his government, overthrow the saints of God and prevail in time and in history. That is an evil heresy, devoid of any understanding of what God has said about himself and about our futures. Our future is already set. We are the victors in Christ. And all these evil people with all their evil plans, they're all under perfect control. They are allowed to operate to the extent that God wants to allow them to operate. They are not out of control. They will never be out of control. And everything you do as a parent, when you influence your child every day, as a teacher, all the different students that get to come through your doors daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, you get a chance to influence them, and that's going to last their entire lives. That's right. There is nothing that can compare to you and how important you are in the life of your children and in the life of your students. You need to be a shining beacon of hope pointing them to where they are going. And if they are in Christ, they are winning. And they are going to win. Evil will not win. Evil has never had a chance of winning. It has hopes. It has aspirations. It overstates itself quite often. But they're all lies. Everything is under control. You can teach your children to be proud of their families, and they should be. You can teach them to be proud of their nations, and they should be. But not to have that as their identity. They should have their identity in the family of God. Because if they're not in the family of God, then they are in the family of Satan. And everything is going to work not together for their good, but toward their condemnation. And it's important that we do not wake up in the morning, turn on our news, and get all worried about what's going on in the world. I don't remember God telling us that the government rests on our shoulders. If I recall correctly, and I know I do, the Bible says that the government of the world is on the shoulders of Christ, somebody who knows what he's doing and has all the power. Not some of the power, all power in heaven and earth. So we can go out and we can do our jobs with confidence. We don't have to worry. See, I just think that it's such a difference of direction whenever you can have a proper perspective. And that's why I love preschool pioneers. That's why I love, if I can, every week to come on and to give everybody a perspective, a hope, about what they're doing, where we are going, and how we're supposed to get there. Teach your children God's word. Teach your students God's word. And have faith that God knows what he is doing. He is on the throne, and he is going to win. Well, thank you again for joining me today on Preschool Pioneers. Talk to you again soon. Thank you, and God bless.